Um, yeah, no, I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think Jerry had paused the recording. So, okay. She's, she's on top of it. So, um, Thank you all for being here. It's noon, so we'll get started, but knowing that people are feel feel free to come in, in and out. We know it's a busy time of year um, and that um, it's everyone's lunch hour. So we really appreciate everyone being here with us today. I'm Carolyn. I'm with the School of Education at Granite State, and I'm so pleased to be presenting with my amazing colleague, Kristen, who is the librarian at Plymouth State. Um, and our plan is to sort of give you um, this sort of brief overview of the Academic Technology Institute, which is a multi-day learning experience that's put on for us by the University Systems Academic Technology Steering Committee, um, whose focus for the past number of years has been around open education and the open education initiative. So. Um, I have the slide deck here for you if you'd like to follow along. I know I like to do that. So the short link is there for you. It's bit.ly forward slash intro to ATI and it is case sensitive. So you want to capitalize the intro as well as each letter um, of ATI. And so before I turn it over to Kristen, we'll just go through a brief um, kind of what to expect. So Kristen um, has been gracious enough to join us and give us an overview, sort of a high level overview of OER, the Open Education Initiative in general, as well as open pedagogy. And then um, I'll share a little bit about our plans for ATI 2020, get you all excited to join us hopefully, and give you some ideas um, for potentially your own projects. So, and by sharing some projects that past alumni ambassadors have done in the past. And then hoping that you'll leave here with um, all of the information you need to go off and apply to um, join us at ATI yourselves. So I'll turn it over to Kristen. I'll monitor the chat and I'm hoping Jerry will as well and we can kind of answer questions as we go. We are recording, but we'll plan to pause or stop the recording just before the Q&A at the end. So hopefully people feel comfortable to jump in and ask your questions and share your ideas knowing that that part won't be disseminated to the public. I know I was always shy about that. So we hope that that uh, alleviates some of your, your stress as well. Um, so thank you, Carolyn. As, uh, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, I am one of the librarians at Plymouth State University, and it is so fun for me that I get to participate in this webinar because uh, ATI was actually my first real introduction to open education, um, maybe four or five years ago. And I've just had such a lovely experience, um, the folks that I've met through ATI um, and the learning opportunities I've had have been really great. So I do hope that what we are able to present to you today does pique your, your interest and that you will consider it. Um, so I wanna, I wanna paint a picture of open ed broadly, but I do, I do wanna start by acknowledging that I think a lot of folks come to open from a place of concern about textbook costs, about learning materials costs. Um, and that's, that's a valid place to start for sure. Um, it's a, something that is definitely on our students' minds. The, um, this slide is, is about some data from a, a textbook company itself, a bookstore company, um, that found that students are actually more worried about paying for their textbooks than they are about their tuition, which might seem odd at first, right? Because we know that the tuition costs are so much greater. Um, but those are often pushed off into the future, right? So those are costs that the students are were dealing with maybe through loans. It's not immediate in the way that textbook costs can be. Um, they need to be budgeted in a very different way. Um, and students are right to be concerned about them. These costs are not, they're not nothing, right? They've increased at a rate that is much greater than inflation for the last uh, couple decades at least. This, um, this data here is from a, a very, very large survey that was done of all students at public higher ed institutions in Florida. And what you're seeing here is the, um, the data in response to the question, have you ever, right? Have you ever done these things as a result of the textbook costs? Um, and I think there's not maybe a ton of surprises here. I don't think any of us teaching in higher ed are surprised to learn that um, students don't necessarily purchase the books. Um, maybe for me, the big surprise was how, how large these numbers were. That the, so we look at those first four bars on the graph and we see that students are not either registering or staying in the courses they might need in order to progress to their degree. 
Um, and if we look at the last two bars, we see that students are, are not doing as well as they could um, if they had access to the, to the materials. Um, so what I think is going on here, this is, really, um, this is really an access issue disguised as a cost issue, right? Um, it's, it's not surprising to us that they don't do as well when they don't have the materials, right? You can't learn from materials <laughs> that you don't have access to. Um, so this is not only kind of a logical conclusion to get to, but also one that is borne out by an increasing um, body of literature. What we're looking at here is a 2018 study, this was done at the University of Georgia, where they did comparisons between uh, two sections of the same course, one that was taught with a traditional um, commercially published textbook and one that was ones that were taught with OER. Um, and they found that at the end of the study, they found um, all the students showed an improvement in, in their throughput rate, which they were defining as so fewer students dropped, fewer students withdrew, and more students finished with C or better. This was true across all groups. Um, but they went a step further and they found that students um, in more at-risk groups, so Pell recipients, um, those as minority groups and part-time students, they found the, the student success, the throughput rates were improved by more in those groups, right? It, it improved for all students, but it improved more um, for the students that are more traditionally underserved by higher ed. Um, so when we are talking about OER, right, we're, we're talking about access, right? So OER are things that are available for free online, or they can be printed at cost. And I think there's a myth that is somehow still persists, the idea that, that something that's free can't be of high quality. Um, and this, there's, there is no reason that that has to be true. Um, and if you find that this is something that you're having to contend with yourself, I would invite you to take a look at um, the OpenStax books. We're looking at a picture of them right now. Um, this was a project that set out to do um, high quality textbooks, um, open, openly available for the 50 highest enrolled courses, um, undergrad courses. So for starters, if you teach any of these uh, introductory courses, definitely, definitely take a look at these. They are excellent. I mean, faculty themselves rate them as very high quality. Um, they are indistinguishable from the commercial offerings from most publishers. Um, but also have a look at them if you just want to get a sense of what is possible, that it isn't necessarily true that just because something is shared freely that it can be a very, very high quality. Um, that said, they are OER are freely available, but that is not their defining characteristic, right? What defines an OER is actually what you're allowed to do with it. Um, so, and the little uh, alliteration that we use to kind of remember what are the things you're allowed to do with an OER um, are the five R's. So you can you can retain an OER. That means you you can keep it. You get to keep it forever. That rental never expires. You never have to give it back, right? You get to keep it. Um, long past your undergrad years. You can reuse it in any way you see fit. You want to format shift it. You want to make it work for you in some creative way. You're welcome to do that. You can revise an OER. And that means you can, you can make whatever changes you want to it. Um, if you want to adapt it for your local context, if you want to make it, you know, up to the second examples, um, something really interesting happens in the course of the semester, you can definitely do that. You can remix an OER. So you could take a couple different OERs. You could take a bunch. You could mash them up together and create a new thing. Um, and lastly, you can redistribute the original or any of your changes any way that you see fit. Um, so far and away, the most common way for a creator to share with the world, to tell other people um, what permissions they have is through the use of the Creative Commons licenses. Um, so you see the, that little um, strip of icons right there. Um, those were developed by the Creative Commons. They've been around for, I don't know, coming up on 20 years now. There's actually a variety of different licenses. Um, there's six of them total, um, but four out of those six are also OER licenses. That means that they allow um, adaptations of the work. So we're not gonna get into detail right now about those licenses or, or really how to find these works. That's something maybe you'll learn more about it at uh, ATI. Um, 
or definitely ask your librarian about this. We love to talk about VR. Um, but keep your eye out for these icons, because I think once, once someone points them out to you and tells you what they mean, um, you will start to see them in more and more places. <clears throat> um, it's been a while. The Creative Commons um, organization, they, they put out an annual report, and I haven't read the most recent one. But the 2018 one, they shared that there's about one and a half billion resources that are currently openly licensed in this way. So this is not, this is no fly by night operation, right? This is something that a lot of people are participating in. <clears throat> um, so when we start thinking about uh, OER, we can see how, yes, if we are, we are opening up our course materials, we, we are increasing the students access to knowledge. But if we think about how OER is actually defined by the permissions that you have, you can see that we're actually opening up the student's ability to be active participants in that knowledge creation. Um, so I just mentioned that you would have the option to edit a textbook if you were to adopt an OER textbook. Um, but you can also then invite your students into that work. Um, you, you can change it for your local context or you can invite your students to change it for the local context, right? These are things that are available in editable format. So there's really a lot of possibility there for student participation in creation, um, which is just one aspect of OpenPed. Um, it really invites us to think about students um, as contributors, um, not just to their own education, also that, um, but to, to the body of knowledge in their field. Um, if you hang around open ped long enough, I think eventually you'll hear the phrase non-disposable assignment. Um, I think this is a really interesting idea. So it's in opposition to what we are calling a disposable assignment. So if we think about, for example, uh, at the end of a semester, maybe a student uh, does their final exam, they, they write it out for an audience of one, right? So that goes to the instructor who then grades it and gives feedback. And maybe that student comes and picks up that paper and reads the feedback and maybe they don't, right? Um, so when we talk about a disposable assignment, we're talking about that sort of thing where the audience is small, the usefulness is um, sort of limited in time and scope. Um, and a non-disposable assignment might be something that reaches beyond um, that space, either in terms of reaching out in time. So if you have your students generate materials for a course that are then used in subsequent sections, um, they have a more meaningful experience. They, they can see that their work is going to go somewhere else beyond just the teacher's desk. Um, a lot of folks are really interested in more public facing assignments for students. I think the Wikipedia editing projects are really fun and exciting examples of this. Um, but there's, there's so many different ways this can go. I mean, there's a lot of folks doing blogging and with their students, it, it's really quite exciting. Um, so this, oh, and I, I guess I should say, because I was sensitive to this for a while, the idea of the, the disposable assignment and, you know, we want to maybe think about ways we can do some non-disposable assignments. We don't mean that that's the only thing we should do, right? Like there's plenty of times where having that safe space that's just between the student and the instructor for practice, right? Like that's still completely valid. We're not saying everything needs to be public all the time, right? It's just that there might be times when it is helpful and beneficial from a, a pedagogical perspective. Um, so what what is open pedagogy? Um, it's a tricky thing to nail down, right? Um, this is, there's still really interesting conversations about this going on online, right? We haven't nailed down the definition. Um, it encompasses a lot of practices um, and it's, the dust hasn't settled yet. And maybe the dust will never settle. Um, and that would be a, a wonderful thing, I think, actually. <coughs> um, so yes, everything on the previous slide, I would say, is an example of open ped. Um, but it also encompasses things that have nothing to do with the learning materials, right? Um, so for some folks, there is a strong commitment to removing other kinds of barriers to education. Um, using openly licensed materials, we remove a cost barrier. Um, but for some folks, it really opens up the possibilities of how, how many other barriers are there that prevent our students from co coming to our class ready and able to learn. Um, and that can be a range of things food insecurity, housing insecurity. Um, 
transportation or childcare issues. Um, so for some folks, open ped is about um, removing any number of barriers to student learning. Um, some folks have a lot of emphasis on open ped as being very learner driven um, in that there is space for the students that instead of deciding before any of the students even show up in the class, here's exactly what we're going to do. Um, instead of leaving room for the contributions of the students in the class, maybe leaving room in the syllabus um, for there to be a little wiggle room for the students to direct um, the course in a way that meets their needs. Um, it encompasses practices like ungrading that are really geared towards um, assessing students in a way that also promotes their own metacognition, their thinking about thinking, um, promotes their ability to, to understand their own learning and, and to continue to be learners beyond um, their degree. Um, and for some folks, there's a strong emphasis on connected learning. So also giving students access to um, the community of practice that they are going to ultimately enter when they graduate, right? So helping students develop their personal learning networks, um, help them understand how they can stay current in their fields even after um, graduation. So, so there's, a, there's a lot going on here, right? We haven't nailed it down and open ped does mean different things to different people. Um, but there's a lot of exciting things going on here. If you are uh, intrigued at this point and you want to see a little bit of that conversation happening right now, I'd encourage you to visit um, openpedagogy.org. There's some really interesting writing there about um, not only the practices, but also the, the thinking behind open pedagogy. Um, so yeah, so there's some good examples there, but also um, in a moment, Carolyn is going to share some more local examples with you. Uh, Carolyn, I think that's it for, for my slides. Great. Thank you, Kristen. So at this point, um, I think what we'd like to do is explain a little bit about what ATI is specifically. Um, and then like Christian, Kristen mentioned, give you some examples of what past ambassador projects have looked like and what ATI has supported in the past um, at our own institutions. So ATI stands for Academic Technology Institute. And like I said, it's this multi-day amazing learning experience that is put on and designed by the USNH Technology Steering Committee to really bring people together, to bring faculty together from all four of our institutions, our USNH institutions, as well as from our community college system to um, support the development of projects that further and promote the open education initiative that Kristen um, just talk to us about. So planning for ATI 2020 is well underway. Um, we're planning for a two-day event to happen at Keene State College this year. So that will take place on May 26th and May 27th. And the planning committee is in the stages of really planning thoughtfully to make this year's ATI a really open um, experience in which the ambassadors um, who are selected are able to really drive their own learning experience and leave the two day sessions with actionable steps and tools that they can immediately apply right away to a specific course that they have in mind um, when they come to the Institute. And so our review team is interested in um, participants and asking participants to consider project ideas that target one of these specific objectives that you see here on the screen. And so those objectives are around all of the things that you heard Kristen talk about. So access, agency, and community. All of those objectives designed with the exact goal of reducing or eliminating those barriers to access to higher education for our students. Um, so access projects, projects that target that objective would really be around improving student access to course materials and resources. So that might look like a project that creates an OER or even adapts an existing OER to replace a traditional text that might exist in a course. An agency project would be a project that really promotes student agency in their own learning. So these projects might sort of redefine, redefine course policies or um, remix an assignment or an assessment that puts more control in the learner's hands um, and gives the learner the authority to make decisions and directions in at least part of what they're learning in a course. 
And then finally, the community objective is really about would be projects that really connect students in some sort of open way. And so these projects might ask students to actually contribute to an open community or to collaborate in their learning somehow out in the open beyond the course walls, beyond the LMS, um, so that they themselves are actually moving, like Kristen said, from consumers of content to actually contributing in a collaborative way in some sort of open space. So I think we can. <laughs> so next we just have some examples for you, um, highlighting a few of your colleagues um, faces that you might recognize, a few recent ambassador projects that could kind of give us some examples of this open work that's happening already at our institutions and hopefully spark some ideas for projects that you have brewing. Um, so this is Jan Covell and Drew Conroy from UNH. Um, Jan's from GSC. Um, they each worked on OER projects that actually were transformative for their students, but actually even more so transformative in their field um, and in their industry, which I think is pretty notable. Um, Drew is, um, he's an animal science professor. We call him the cow guy. If you, if you got to, um, anyone who knows about his project affectionately calls him the cow guy. Um, he has an extensive background and content, lots of content already he had um, and from his expertise in his field. So by way of text that he's written and images that he had captured related to the judging of cattle. And he was able to use all of this expertise to create an OER for his students to replace a, a text. And so not only did his students benefit from this amazing reputable source, but um, we're witnessing now um, the farming industry actually accessing Drew's source and his students are able to see him contribute to his own industry in a, in a real way, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then Jan, in a similar story, she's an um, instructor and director of our career, career development um, and life planning over at Granite. And for her, she, she was finding that nearly all of the textbooks related to her course that were available to her were really targeted to traditional age students. Um, and of course, as you might know at Granite, our students can range anywhere from 18 to 60 years old. Um, and so Jan's students were representing needs that were quite different from the ones addressed in traditional textbooks. On top of that, Jan's industry is rapidly changing. Um, as we know, the way people find and apply for jobs is constantly changing thanks to technology and it, was made, it makes it really difficult for textbooks to keep up. And so what Jan did was she found an open ed resource that was already created that she liked and um, took it and was able to adapt it to fit the needs of her students. So she took out nearly the whole first half of the text and were able to recreate context, content to fit the needs um, of her adult learners and her, specifically her career changers. Um, what's really cool about her project is that she actually um, got some feedback and some praise from the original author of the text that she borrowed, Dave Dillon. Um, and what happened was it opened opportunities for her students to then be able to connect with Dave, the original author, in future courses. And those students are now collaborating with him to make yet another iteration um, of the text in a future capstone course. And so these types of projects are really powerful because they A, have widespread, widespread reach and impact much more than a traditional textbook can um, because they're living documents that are able to meet a specific need like we can see with, with um, Jan and really open the door to new learning oppor opportunities that might not um, exist in a traditional way. Another, oh, so these are all examples of, of access. Yeah, <laughs> that's so I wouldn't forget to say. Um, so these are examples of access, meeting that access objective in our first objective. Um, a second example for you um, is from Denise Bergstead, who is an assistant professor at Keene State. She's in the environmental studies department. And she used her ATI project to revamp the way she approached grading in her classes. Um, instead of the traditional approach, Denise worked on a plan at ATI to create a model where her students earned points for assignments that they selected as wanting to complete. And so Denise now awards points to her students for any successfully completed tasks. She gives them 
either 100% of the points for complete assignments or zero points for incomplete assignments. And then complete tasks um, are sort of accrued until students um, are in the grade that they wish to receive in the course. Um, students do have to earn a certain sort of like minimum amount in different categories of assignments and different types of assignments. But other than that, students can choose the type of assignments they want to work on and they can even work to complete and earn the grade that they wish to earn in the class, which is really powerful. Um, as you can see in the quote on the slide, um, Denise is getting really positive feedback from students who've had, um, who've been impacted by traditional grading um, practices in a negative way. And the, the project is really powerful because it honors students' learning preferences and puts them in charge of what they wish to learn, how much they want to learn about it, um, and how deep they want to go while still meeting the objectives um, necessary for her course. And so this is an example of an agency project that would fit that second objective for that we're looking at for ATI. And then our final example um, comes from Lisa Donner and Emily Gannon. Lisa is an environmental science professor and Emily is um, with the School of Education at Granite. Um, Lisa's with um, Plymouth State. And they both were able to connect their students to um, public groups in the open in their respective disciplines um, and ask them to openly collaborate and create and contribute content to their individual fields um, during their courses. So what Lisa did was she connected her students to working professionals in her field and she asked them to collaborate with those practitioners to identify skill gaps that were creating barriers to the hiring process for new graduates. Um, and the students were actually able to contribute to the identification of those and problem solving around that with the practitioners. And Emily was able to use technology, specifically um, Facebook and Twitter, to connect her students to the field and to practice. Um, so connecting her students that were in her class with practitioners, with alumni of her course, um, and even with authors of the texts that she was using in the course, um, and creating discussion spaces that moved outside of the LMS so that um, many more voices were heard um, in her discussions. And these projects are really powerful because they brought in the audience for student work um, to include practitioners and other experts in the field and really increases the relevancy of the tasks that we ask our students to do. And these are examples of projects that would fit our community objective for ATI 2020. So I'm not going to read all this to you. And if you have access to the slide deck, you can if, you, if, if you'd like. But basically, these are quotes from both students who have benefited from um, open projects that our ATI ambassadors have done in the past, and quotes from faculty who have attended ATI about the learning experience in general. Um, we do tend to get positive feedback. It's a fun experience. And clearly, our students um, across all of our institutions are benefiting um, from the experience in general. Links at the bottom are to um, student panels and participant <coughs> panels where people can share their experiences with OPEN. And so those are video recordings if you'd like to access them. So I think at this point, we'd like to kind of um, I think we'll, we'll stop the recording, Jerry, at this time, if, if that's okay with you. Um, we'd love for to kind of hear from each of you.